Well, very good morning to everyone and thank you so much for joining us for MAC 2022 Preview Week. Um, as we've got a series of webinars taking place this week and hopefully you'll be able to join us for a number of them. Um, our first one today will kick off in two minutes, but I just wanted a quick reminder that you can ask questions throughout. So if you see down the right hand side of your screen, there is a question chat function. If you want to put any questions in there, then at the end of the presentation, I will relay those and uh, we'll make this a bit more interactive. Um, just to let you know, I'm operating the slides today. So we are going for a little bit of a sort of Downing Street briefing of next slide, please. Um, just in case you wonder why we're doing that. Um, our first today is Dave Holmes from BAE System. Um, Dave, he started his career with British Aerospace in 1984 as an apprentice and he's been with the company for over 30 years undertaking a variety of roles across a number of sites in the UK. Uh, worked with international partners, suppliers and customers across the globe. Currently operation and technology director for the air sector within BAA systems. This role has the functional responsibility of operational activities within the air sector, spanning people, processes, systems, governance and physical activities. Moreover, he was awarded an OBE for services to manufacturing in the aerospace sector in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2020. So, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dave Holmes. Good morning, James. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and thanks for giving me this opportunity uh, to give you some insights around our uh, Tempest program uh, and some of the challenges that that will bring forward from manufacturing. Uh, more importantly, how BA Systems is working with a very large extended uh, supply chain um, in terms of addressing some of those, those challenges. So, next slide, please, James. Thank you. So, so firstly, uh, important to uh, so take a view of, of the, uh, the RAF and other NATO members. Um, assets at the moment that they uh, use for providing frontline uh, policing uh, and offensive capability uh, and as we know that the UK has invested heavily you know uh, since the uh, early ambitions of flight uh, in in fixed wing uh, aircraft uh, solutions um, you know people are very familiar with the typhoon program and latterly the, the F-35 joint strike fighter program um, because of the uh, the changes of of evolving threat then the UK customer and I'm working with other international partners has posed a challenge on how can it extend its capability um, in, in, a, in, a, in a different form uh, to extend the life of, of protection uh, and ability to deliver duties out uh, well beyond uh, 2080. Uh, and, and to that regard, then industry has been challenged on bringing forward uh, essentially a system of system, something which will be game changing uh, in its approach uh, and recognising that we're now dealing with being challenged with a, set, a requirement set from the Ministry of Defences uh, within the UK and around the world and then coming up with solutions which would go into service in 2035 um, at that initial operating standard and then have a level of upgradability uh, through life and maybe out of, out of service 2080, 2090. So it's a long time horizon and we understand you know, in terms of what the uh, the aerospace sector brings with it is that ability to force uh, step changes in the uh, engineering and manufacturing solutions uh, to meet those ambitions. Uh, you know, it's in nobody's interest for us to uh, decide that we're going to bring forward, uh, you know, uh, radios with valves in. Uh, use that as a, as a bad analogy. So, to meet the requirements of our customers uh, and understand what's needed, then it's really clear that we need to bring forward at, at that industry level. Uh, something which really is uh, futuristic, unsupportable, unreliable, and more importantly, means that the initial entry into service, the customer has got new capability and actually doesn't start to see regression from the capability they're relying on uh, to give frontline protection uh, and defence of the nations. So, next slide. So, what's been taking place so far? So to underpin this set of requirements and move it away from being, you know, sort of a, a, a broad ambition, UK government's committed uh, to producing a combat air strategy, 
uh, which it formally launched uh, at Farnborough in 2018. Of course, 2018 seems uh, a long time ago when we all used to be able to get out and, uh, and meet each other uh, physically rather than virtually. But that really was a pivotal moment for uh, UK industry with the UK government committing uh, in, in terms of this uh, strategic paper that, that it launched, a formal set of requirements and laying out its ambition. And the ambition being that industry and government would work together uh, in partnership and bringing together novel solutions uh, in, and working in a different way to address some of the challenges uh, set down as envisaged by, uh, by the uh, UK government. And by the end of 2020, uh, to start to address those challenges, so some uh, 18 months, two years on from uh, when the uh, strategy had been launched, uh, there was nearly 2,000 people working uh, on the experiments, over 60 technical experiments, as well as uh, doing industrial studies and collaborative studies uh, around the world uh, to start to mature ideas and concepts. One important thing to note at this stage is, uh, you know, classically we, we think of the solutions in the uh, in the air sector has been what I would describe as one platform. So it's a Typhoon, it's a Hawk, it's an F-35. To meet the combat air strategy uh, and, and the uh, perceived uh, threat that the governments and, and, and partner nations see out in the, the 2030s, 2040s time uh, arena, then it's likely that this will be a mixed solution. So we use it in, in our terminology as a, a system of system. So likely to be what we see as a, a manned fighter, probably supported by an unmanned fighter, a loyal wingman uh, that, that's uh, an asset that can go and, and uh, prosecute you know, dull, dirty, dangerous type work, and maybe then supported by something which is a tritable, um, uh, an asset which is of lower cost uh, and you know maybe uh, lower capability, but is actually expendable. And it's that range of, of, of suite of assets that brings together the combat air strategy solution. The other important thing to note is that this, uh, in the 2030s, 2040s, 2050 timescale, uh, is, is the introduction of this solution that sits alongside the assets that the UK customer uh, and other nations continue to operate. So, you know, what, what we see in the defence industry is not a digital uh, swap over. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a scarf in and a scarf out of capability uh, uh, with assets retired as more and more capability comes onto the new offering. So we envisage by the end of this year, uh, and this is all a, a, a against uh, this COVID backdrop that we're all having to accommodate, you know, over two and a half thousand people working on this endeavour. So it just gives some scale of the commitment from industry and the government um, to bring this forward. Uh, and you can see on there sort of over 600 suppliers and that, that supply chain, and I'll cover more on that in, in the presentation uh, in, in a short while, uh, is from very large blue chip international organisations, uh, FTSE 100, Fortune 500, uh, down into very small SMEs. And the ambition here is to make sure in my language we are bringing in the best of breed of intellect and capability to really build a world beta solution. You also notice some flags on the side. Uh, that's really important. You know, the UK government has been very clear on this. In terms of its ambition to bring forward a next generation future combat air system, you know, Team Tempest, then it needs a level of collaboration with other uh, government nations. And you can see on there Sweden and Italy as two partner nations that have, that have signed up to form this trilateral, trilateral arrangement with the UK customer. Next slide. So to keep the uh, the program at the forefront of his mind, the UK government has, has been uh, extremely bold in terms of setting down its ambitions and, and has really created um, uh, a balanced uh, value proposition and, uh, and has a good number of taxpayers on the call. You know, this should sit well with everybody. You know, the top left hand side there, focusing on military capability, the core fundamentals of, of why the government needs a new range of capabilities to uh, defend its sovereign capability, uh, keep us safe and, and, and project uh, uh, soft and hard power as part of our foreign policy around, around the world. But there's some other key components in there. 
uh, the UK government recognises that there is significant prosperity uh, and industrial capability offerings of a programme of scale of this size and the duration that it runs. And if you think about the, the headlines that I gave that sort of, you know, first entry to service 2035, then, you know, the people who will fly these aeroplanes may not have even been born yet. So never mind even starting school and that will be around homeschool at the moment. You know, they've not even been born. And certainly people will see this asset and system uh, to its out of service life must definitely have been born. So this is now about can we use the catalyst of a program of this nature to uh, create uh, greater prosperity and wealth and underpin the, uh, the government's um, aspirations of, of sustaining uh, and, and creating this uh, intellectual powerhouse back in the UK. It also recognises the international influence. So, you know, this is a programme uh, for collaboration by design. This brings in uh, international partners at day one, uh, which creates export opportunities and at the same time uh, underpins uh, our ability as the UK to combine uh, forces around the foreign policy. Uh, and finally, around the budget, uh, you know, like all things, uh, most people uh, want more for less. Uh, the uh, challenge set down with the combat air strategy is no different. It's asking for something to be to be achieved in broadly half the time that we've seen historically on the rollout of complex uh, air systems, whether that be tornado or typhoon or F-35, uh, and therefore uh, bring a cost point which is significantly lower in terms of the non-recurring and startup, and then through that pr production phase of the program. And the only way that's going to be achieved is by taking some very bold and novel approaches, bringing new technologies, new ways of working, uh, new skill sets. Uh, and that's the, uh, the thrust of the, the presentation uh, that I offer you today. Next slide, please. So what have we been doing in, in the last couple of years? So from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, we recognise there are a whole series of uh, enabling capabilities that need to be brought together, integrated, tested and matured for us to have confidence that we can turn to UK customer and the wider international collaborators and demonstrate uh, with real empirical data that we have a solution to deliver something in half the time at significantly lower cost point. And to do that, this, is, this has been a, a long running programme uh, where we've brought together uh, the whole digital manufacture uh, end to end of the digital thread through engineering design, model based systems engineering, linked together automation, smart supply chains, uh, clever uh, materials and solutions, and uh, bring that together around a product so we can demonstrate uh, the comparators between the synthetic model in the digital world and a real life experiment. Um, and to do that, we've created uh, what you can see on the, uh, in terms of the, the cartoon, uh, essentially a sandpit, a factory of the future, whereby we are experimenting uh, and linking in with uh, a good number of partners to achieve this. So next slide. Collaboration is at the heart of, of, of what, what we're we'll trying to prove. Um, and I mentioned at the All Up programme level, we've got over 600 uh, uh, partners uh, working with us through that supply chain. In terms of our experiments in this manufacturing arena, uh, there's nearly 100 companies and some of them we can see on there in terms of brands and, and maybe some of colleagues from those organisations are joining uh, this, this webinar this morning. Um, what you'll hopefully get from this is uh, a recognition from within the uh, uh, air sector in the defence arena that we want to bring on best of breed. We want to look in adjacent areas, in emergent technology areas and extract the, the company's learning and experience and integrate and fuse that together to give us a game changing solution. So there's some names on there that you're very familiar with, but there's some that you're not. And there are some uh, SME organizations there which have been spin offs from uh, academic organizations. You know, startup comes in the UK that we are keen to see prosper and grow. Uh, and more importantly, take learning out from the experiments that we're conducting and allow them to grow their business. Uh, and exploit it uh, out with the, uh, the work that they're doing with VA Systems and the other Tempest partners. The other important element of this is because of the longevity of these programs, you know, sort of a, the 100-year journey, 
then we recognize there is a role and indeed an obligation, not just of ourselves as, as Team Tempest, but also of the organizations that we're, we're, we're bringing with us uh, to start to identify what are the future skills and capabilities that we need uh, within our engineers and manufacturers of the future. And how do we use this as a showcase and a promoter to encourage young people to want to prosecute uh, future careers in engineering and manufacturing uh, and set down those agendas for learning. Uh, and there's nothing better than being able to uh, come and, come and uh, visit this uh, big digital sandpit that we've got uh, with physical product. Uh, and again, you know, um, hopefully as we uh, start to come out of our, our COVID scenario, uh, the, uh, the doors will open up again and, and uh, people on this call are more than welcome to, uh, to uh, arrange visits to come and see how we're getting on. Uh, so next slide, please. So at the start of this, uh, this journey, um, as a team, we set down a very uh, bold ambition and recognising that we've got uh, decades of experience in producing complex military weapon systems, fast jet aircraft. Uh, we come from hopefully a position of knowledge, architectural knowledge. So our vision was very clear. Could we develop a solution from a manufacturing enterprise which is product agnostic? At this stage, we don't know what the product is, we don't know what it's going to look like. We've got broad ideas of its size. Uh, we understand some of the uh, engineering requirements in terms of its low observability and structural capabilities uh, and, and takeoff weight. Uh, but we're not sure on work share. We're not sure in terms of build rates. We're not sure in terms of the, uh, the variance of the models and how much overlap or indeed how much difference will there be between each of these variants as they evolve through life to respond to a perceived and a real emerging uh, military threat uh, and for us to be current and effective in there. So you can see there in terms of that schematic, uh, you know, a very flexible uh, uh, enterprise, something that we recognized, you know, for it to be efficient, it, it needed to take on board uh, a lot of the capability that you'll hear uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Jürgen Meyer, uh, explain uh, later on today in one of the, uh, the other sessions. Uh, could we come up with something which is digitally connected? Could we come up with something that just doesn't connect to the product, but it connects the engineering data sets, it connects the supply chain, it connects the operator, and it can do it through life? And can we see how we can take use of these new technology, emerging technologies, and fuse them together? So against that ambition, uh, if we move on, please, uh, we realized that uh, we need to do something physical. Uh, and to underpin this, we set off with creating a project team to essentially design and build a mock-up of a front fuselage of a next generation vehicle. Uh, and that's what you can see in front of you. Uh, that's the, the 3D uh, representation. And what we were trying to do from that, and indeed we are still doing and we're on this journey, is explore new ways of working, new materials, new technologies, new construction approaches, um, new tool sets with a variety of skills and experience so we could have physical and virtual representation. So when people talk about a digital twin, we wanted to create a digital twin of the product, of the supply chain, of the factory, of the qualification uh, data uh, and run this all the way through our ecosystem uh, to prove the step change in performance that we've seen from you know data that we've been gathering over 30, 40 years from our prior experiences uh, using uh, different solutions uh, and, and you know earlier uh, generations of those capabilities. Now that benefits assurance piece is really key. In the same time, we also wanted to capture uh, the standards and specifications that would inform how a factory would look for 2030 and how we would then turn to the marketplace to be able to specify equipment and solutions with confidence that um, we, we become uh, an intelligent acquirer uh, and recognize that as part of this there's an international uh, element to it that we may be having to share our knowledge with our partners um, on the program to make sure we've got the best of breed approach so that, that product that you can see on there, it, it's about six meters in length. So this isn't small. This is a, you know, this isn't sort of an Airfix kit type solution. Uh, this, is a, this is a real live uh, uh, fast jet product. So next slide, please. 
So the first step on that journey is, uh, and I mentioned about um, connected environments. So could we create this factory uh, and solution connecting everybody together? And everybody talks about, you know, uh, industrial 4.0, uh, you know, the, the in, uh, industrial internet of things. So could we actually do that? Could we form this together, give real-time visualization, so visualization with the design team, through the manufacturing engineering team, out into supply chain, people making parts for us, and then people actually trying to uh, assemble the, the product together and to track that operational efficiency and understand some of the challenges as you bring different people from different generations together to work in these environments. And of course, if you uh, subscribe to the, uh, the ages theories that you know people of a, of a certain demographic uh, struggle to engage with technology, versus those who were just on early school leavers and are already familiar with being immersive uh, gaming technology, that you'll see a, a step change in, in competence and capability it was a key thing we want to understand. You know, a significant portion of the working workforce, not just within our company, but within the UK at large, you know, is not in the early school leavers uh, and, uh, and the age range. Uh, and those people bring a tremendous amount of skill, knowledge and experience. It's how do you harness that in this whole digital world uh, to make sure that what you've not done is inadvertently create a two-tier economy and exclude them. So it's a big challenge. And, and what you're trying to do then is take their knowledge and embed it in the uh, in the IT and in the, the tool sets and the rules to make sure that we uh, end up with a, a more effective solution at day one. Next slide. We wanted to ex explore uh, a number of novel technologies. So much has been made of uh, disruptive technologies, disruptive materials coming forward. Some examples here, you can see comparators of what happens when you start using uh, additive uh, solutions. So um, the, uh, the bracket painted at the top, uh, traditional subtractive approach, uh, most people are familiar with sort of a three axis or, or, or four axis milling approach to produce that from a solid aluminium billet. The other products on there are um, uh, topographically optimized so these are organic shapes produced in a modeling system uh, that allows us to uh, rapidly create ideas to apply loads uh, where they are needed and create uh, parts very very quickly very effectively so in a, in a uh, you know a backdrop of uh, reducing time to market being more energy efficient in terms of producing higher integrity parts that's brought with it some uh, significant uh, challenges and changes for us. And in terms of where we are exploring um, the additive space, and again, in collaboration uh, with uh, UK suppliers and UK academia, you know, we're moving away from what I would describe as des desktop trinkets uh, into very large uh, near-net near shape components, uh, extending into half a metre uh, and a metre plus of high integrity, highly loaded parts. Now that brings with it a whole series of, of challenges around the material properties. It brings opportunity spaces around uh, the UK looking at machine tools and um, affiliated processes to be able to produce parts of this integrity, uh, shape and size. But again, that, that's a game changer for the uh, aerospace and defence sector. And indeed, I think it's a game changer for UK at large, but it's only been enabled by these modern digital tool sets uh, and the establishment of an effective supply chain that sits in around that. Um, so what you're now seeing on there are parts which are broadly, you know, 60% uh, shorter in lead time, 60% uh, uh, cheaper to make, um, and typically compared to, you know, defects per 100,000, you know, we're seeing a 20 to 30% uh, reduction uh, in, in defects. So aiming for that right first time philosophy. The other benefits that you see from this sort of technology is the ability to tailor and have, have high customization. One of the objectives of this program was to see whether we could um, essentially challenge all of the norms around learning curves um, and see whether we could get to uh, essentially an economical backsize of one. And these disruptive technologies take us on a, on a, a good step forward on that journey. Next slide, please. Now, because the challenge is to do things in, in, in half the time uh, and, and considerably cheaper, everybody always focuses on what I would call the, the touch end of the process, uh, whereby we've got uh, the engineer or the uh, manufacturing operative uh, adding value. 
we all know that our extended logistics and supply chains um, contribute a, a significant uh, level of uh, time to the, the overall time to market from inception of an idea through into uh, repetitious manufacture. Uh, or indeed, they also absorb significant amounts of working capital um, and there's a, a significant number of people in most enterprises working in the back office uh, to feed the front line, you know, the end product and outcome. And one aspect of this program in terms of us challenging it is, is looking at uh, intralogistics. Can we introduce, back to my ecosystem again, can we introduce a whole series of new enabling technologies that allows us to link together our ERP system with our stores and queuing system, with intelligent systems around part identification, uh, pick and place, kitting and tracking, uh, and then on there you can see a, a smart technology using um, essentially a, a, an AGV, which has got um, SLAM technology built into it. A number of these things scuttling about the factory like robot wars, delivering parts and material to point of use at the uh, time allocated, so reducing the overall factory floor space uh, and again allowing that, that reconfigurable design and the beauty of some of these technologies that we've been exploring uh, with this autonomous delivery system is that these things will find their own way there and they're adaptable to be able to tow things as well as lift uh, and kit and create um, and creating a, a 5g environment within the factory enterprise so we don't play hunt the parts hunt the tool anymore uh, we know where everything is so that connected environment as that overlay uh, becomes very effective, not just on producing the parts, but also controlling that ecosystem that sits behind it in terms of driving that overall efficiency. I think most people on the call recognize that that driver to uh, reduce the inefficiency of the operator at the point of building in the manufacture cycle has got to be a good thing rather than us trying to convince everyone that they must become twice as efficient by working harder. Um, uh, and that helps with some of the uh, some of the other challenges we know we've got as a nation in terms of uh, narrowing down the productivity gap between the UK uh, and Europe and the rest of the world. Next slide, please. So we've already teetered on this in terms of autonomy. Um, you know, a big push from the UK government around machine learning, artificial intelligence, and in terms of the manufacturing space, I see no less applicable. Uh, what you can see here, and this is a good example of, of blends of youth, a uh, gentleman on the left-hand side has worked for the company longer than the uh, young man on the right-hand side uh, has, has, uh, has managed to live so far. Uh, and bringing those skills together, uh, that's a sub-assembly. You can see how we've brought in uh, mobile uh, platforms, linking in cobotics, linking in uh, uh, close control drilling, um, so that we can now create uh, a mobile solution that can... Um, move around a product, uh, find locations and drill holes and uh, uh, sort of develop that close uh, closed loop system. So these things are uh, gathering all the data all the time. The, the, the beauty of this system, this connected network that we, we think is a game changer, is the ability to scavenge information and data constantly, upload it into uh, our on-site cloud solution, our data lake, and harvest that. So we are being able to demonstrate the uh, quality control aspects, the integrity of the product, all the way through its build cycle, uh, rather than inspecting it at the end. Uh, and, and what I'm looking for there is for us to be able to essentially understand the DNA of what's taking place for every attribute all the way through the build. And this sort of technology in terms of bringing that autonomy in and being able to predict when things are going wrong, stop the process, uh, uh, really gives us uh, a new uh, facet in, in, that, in that challenge of, of efficiency. Next slide, please. So what you've now seen is that, that whole makeup of all of the different ingredients. And, and one would argue that, um, you know, for, from uh, people listening today, there'll be a number of those elements that you'll either be marketing or you'll seen before. Uh, the key challenge for us was, could we actually integrate all these things together? And I think it very much like an orchestra. Uh, each individual musician being excellent in their own right, but can they actually be brought together to play a complete composition uh, that's world beating? And what we've done is create this environment, and this is for us, uh, it, you know, it, it sets back, you know, we were on a five year journey uh, in partnership with Siemens, could we bring this together in a, a Siemens environment 
using that tool set uh, and it integrates all of these different aspects to uh, create that step change and more importantly demonstrate evidence and record it so first time we're using smart tools we still have lots of uh, lots of hand activity um, uh, around our, our assembly and build structures it's inevitable by the nature and shape and configuration uh, you know this the restrictive nature means that there's, there's little substitute at the moment with the technology well, and we will get there with intelligent vision systems but it still requires uh, a level of, of hand uh, intervention so we've been working on on using uh, uh, smart uh, electric tools um, which are recording data all the time uh, preset capabilities and again uploading and scavenging that data to demonstrate build uh, and again we've, we've seen the mobile platform but then you start bringing all this together uh, and moving away from you know what's a, an interesting sub assembly into something a, a little bit more uh, visual uh, as a full aircraft so next slide so on our journey uh, we uh, have conducted a number of experiments outside of the factory environment so this is with our colleagues out at nottingham university and what we want to do was see whether we could integrate people in with robots uh, so this isn't used sort of uh, desk mounted cobots these are real full-scale heavy duty industrial robots with control systems that are the accuracy of machine tools but have got the stability and control mechanisms that allow operators to enter their working environment for prolonged periods of time and what we can see there as part of our building block approach was to make a centrifuge for um, a, a mock-up of, of, of a next generation vehicle you know from someone who comes from a, a generation of when robots were first introduced into factory enterprise placed in cages uh, to wasn't quite sure whether they were protecting the workers from the robots the robots from the workers uh, this step change that we've been working on and, and seen in for say the last four or five years to be able to get confidence with control and safe systems of work and mechanisms around these devices you know has moved on immeasurably as has as has the uh, control loops we move on please so from that uh, work at nottingham uh, we then replicated that and enhanced it within our own factory environment uh, and from this you know uh, again we've changed the control systems on robots and introduced the same control systems that i've got on my five axis and six axis milling machines so we can control the accuracy and integrate it in uh, very sophisticated and accurate uh, measuring systems to create a closed loop environment so this is all around positional control what we've also done is, is recognize that the investments that uh, the uk has made both internally within our own companies and within the supply chain the accuracy of parts and more importantly repeatability of parts that we can produce now is a game changer in terms of addressing some of these challenges so in the past there's been you know allowances made for uh, adjustment, settling, phrasing, what, whatever terminology people have with. Uh, there's no need uh, for that to take place now. What we're, what we're demonstrating here is our ability to have uh, absolute part-to-part -part, uh, um, location uh, with full-size holes uh, to eliminate uh, a, a number of uh, manual interventions, which now gives us a, a, a different position around our build accuracy. Uh, and remember that uh, the shape of our products and the control of the, the inner and outer mold line is critical next slide so reflect back on our vision about a cell which is product agnostic and reconfigurable uh, we work closely uh, again with a, a, another uh, key uh, innovative engineering company in the uk uh, electro impact to devise uh, a modular flooring system uh, and you can see the pedestals for robots to be mounted on so uh, working with uh, Electro Impact as our systems integrator, and bringing that technology forward, we've now created this reconfigurable space, like a big chessboard that allows us to reconfigure the factory. Uh, and, and what we wanted to do was link that in with uh, essentially the crane system with a, a follow me function that the uh, crane uh, is integrated in with the work instructions uh, and understands when it needs to lower the hook for us to be able to reconfigure that cell and pick the robot up um, and you can see uh, for the keynote amongst you some clever QR codes on top of those pedestals so that the uh, system knows when that pedestal is in the right orientation 
through uh, through sort of the, the, the 9180. Uh, so again, uh, you're then creating a set date and points to allow us to build. Next slide, please. So when you start bringing all of that together, you'll see the uh, the setup with a front fuselage section. So that's a, a very large bulkhead at the back. So imagine that the that's sort of the back of the pilot would interface the center fuse. That's roughly uh, two meters by one and a half meters, just to give some aspects on it uh, against the floor. That you can see led on, on some uh, flexible tooling, uh, that all being on rails, uh, and that robot working uh, to bring in a keel that it then turns through 90 degrees. Uh, and, and what you've now got is th this uh, solution that's bringing components together. Uh, all of those components uh, are, have been treated with parts which are uh, reach compliance, which is not chromated paint, so get next generation sustainability uh, aspects in that as well, and then allowing. Um, uh, stack drilling uh, with uh, robots again so no hard tooling uh, total flexibility uh, through that and again demonstrating the ability to use automation for repeatability in, in whole production um, and all the time bringing that, that data data back so our ambition through the rest of this year is to complete the front fuse build uh, all the parts are released to manufacture uh, there's composite skin there's composite tooling that runs around this uh, and really challenging uh, the way that we uh, address and uh, attack some of these complex problems. But recognizing that this, you know, will uh, enter into a design phase in uh, notionally uh, 2025 timeframe uh, and then uh, lead through into, uh, you know, 2025 to 2030 in terms of a, a pre production build cycle, uh, with, you know, with early flight in the 2030s. Uh, it's important that we as industry, uh, you as colleagues and supporters on the on this line, uh, and academia in the UK government, yes, return its investment. So next slide, please. Um, what we are keen to do is take uh, early advantage from some of the things that we've learned. So um, th this is a just a, a great example of that. Um, we've been working closely with the AMRC uh, over at Sheffield. Uh, and you can see a company on the Fairfield, uh, another one of our systems integration companies. And we've uh, worked closely to develop our own version uh, of a smart bench and there's, there's other people's software and capabilities on there. Um, and, and this ability to uh, bring in uh, automation and mature it beyond TRL level six for people who are familiar with those NASA scales and then drive these opportunities back into our existing, uh, our existing product lines so that gives advantage uh, to us in terms of being able to offer a more repeatable uh, and efficient uh, product solution um, and you know allows us to have confidence to be able to uh, sort of uh, uh, build in those those anticipated savings in in future opportunities uh, of sales uh, and or indeed help with some of our uh, industrialization export opportunities and the benefit out of this is you know reinvestment in the capability back within the uh, catapult network which is absolutely essential to not just BA systems but also the, the wider uh, industrial and manufacturing base in the UK but also seeing uh, companies such as Fairfield they've been on the journey with us for a good number of years now uh, uh, eking benefit out from this in terms of being able to uh, produce uh, repeat uh, product uh, as we start to take these uh, facilities into market so all those examples there are, are being used on the on Typhoon and again we've seen the improvements through this uh, allow us to demonstrate that even after uh, you know 600 plus uh, aircraft builds uh, we're now starting starting to beat the learning curves that we've seen previously um, which is impressive when you think about the amount of learning that will take in place from the, the mid 1990s uh, through to uh, this point in time uh, and then take that capability and, and, and exploit it on the f-35 program which you know hopefully we've got another 50 years plus uh, production on in, in support of our uh, US colleagues. Um, so you start to see some real opportunity space out of this. Uh, and this is why we're keen that, you know, we share the broader ambition of, you know, how do we get half the time, drive significant efficiency out of that? How do we act as a, as a collector uh, and a magnet for uh, great ideas, new innovations, uh, people who are thinking all the time, at least we forget, 
you know, the UK uh, is at the centre of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. You know, we need to be at the centre of it again now uh, and, you know, uh, start to, to bring together all that great skill and wealth of experience uh, to address these challenges uh, and make more of it. Next slide, please. Um, but none of this, of course, is of any use if we don't have the next generation of engineers and manufacturers. And what we're seeking to do, as you've seen all the way through this, is make sure that we can share our experiences, provide young people an opportunity to come and see uh, how exciting manufacturing engineering is, uh, how we make a difference as an industrial sector, so not BA systems, but an industrial sector at large, uh, people are taking time out to join this call this morning, uh, and how people can have you know, long and noble careers uh, and really make a difference and demonstrate that they really are at the top of the game. So this is giving us lots of opportunity for that. It's also given us an ability, as I, as I mentioned previously, to flush out what are the new skills that are going to be needed and more importantly, start to create those connections between the uh, capabilities that young people are learning in schooling today and what they're seeking to do in their recreational lives uh, and show them that there's a real world application in engineering and manufacturing uh, move forward. Okay, last slide. So uh, uh, thank you from me this morning. I hope you found that interesting. I hope that's given you some insights in terms of the scale of ambition around the Tempest program, uh, you know, commitments from the UK government to a future combat air strategy sort of sets the, the, the wheels in motion for uh, potentially 80 to 100 years of innovative research, engineering, manufacturing uh, that will need a step change in all of our thinking for us to be competitive. Uh, we've seen how effective uh, large programs, whether they be defence, or infrastructure or, or commercial products are in terms of uh, providing opportunities, uh, work and uh, revenue for many people for many decades. Uh, and I think you start to see now in terms of the, the baby steps that we're making on this long journey and hopefully uh, provide some, uh, some thoughts and some good questions in terms of how you can contribute and more importantly, how you can take some of this learning to go and enhance your own business uh, and opportunities. So thank you for listening. Dave, thank you very much. That's been really appreciated. Um, as you can imagine, we have got a few questions coming in, so I'm going to jump straight in with those, if that's all right, um, and try and put them in some sort of order. So we'll see how we go as we go along. Um, the first comment we had um, a bit earlier on, it said, you rightly emphasise the importance of encouraging future generations of technologists through the Tempest programme approach. Uh, it's agreed that that is vital. Can you undertake also to give help to opportunities through the critical supply chains to UK tooling and equipment manufacturers rather than simply preferring UK based distributors and resellers of overseas equipment? Yeah, I think that's an important point. I, I think, I think um, you know, we, we, we need to uh, be clear that this will be um, an evidence based approach. So what I'm keen to do is, is share and with, with other colleagues of, of the other partner uh, companies, share this, the size of the challenge and encourage that, that innovation and solution uh, to be brought forward. Um, you know, the, the beauty of sharing this now and, and the leading that we've got is we've got a decade uh, for us to be able to come together and build effective solutions uh, rather than uh, seeing these investments uh, uh, go overseas. Now, the challenge I think we're going to have, and I know we've got uh, colleagues from uh, uh, Lloyds Bank later, um, you know, for companies to be efficient and effective and take advantage of some of these technologies so they can demonstrate efficiencies, it's going to need an effective uh, set of business cases, which needs to be built uh, not just on opportunities around Tempest, because I would suggest if, if we're relying just on building business cases on the Tempest uh, proposals, it's probably uh, slightly too late in, in some arenas. It won't be in all, but it will be in some. So it needs a balanced approach, uh, and I think that's why it needs organisations to look at some of these opportunities and challenges uh, in balance, that they are applicable in every sector. And I think companies that can demonstrate that novelty uh, and applicability to, to pick up these sorts of ideas and innovations and go, that's applicable in the automotive sector, that's applicable in the energy sector, that's applicable in the rail and transportation, 
scale. And that's applicable in the, in the, the pharma, in, in the, the biomedical, and so on and so forth. And I think a, a number of these capabilities are cross-cutting um, uh, across those areas. And I think that makes uh, for effective business cases and will allow suppliers such as the, the uh, individual that's questioning this to be able to start to make that transitional journey now. And of course, it needs great support from the government. You know, the, the government's, uh, you know, committed to this. I, I mentioned it was, you know, that, that uh, key strand in there in terms of making sure that there's economic gain um, from big programmes such as this. Uh, and I think it needs us to come together to be clear what help do we need to make sure that the uh, we maximise the onshoring uh, of this in, in a direct sense. And I guess a, a slight sub question to that that links is um, do you know what the likely spend on manufacturing technology will be throughout the program? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's, it's all to do with the boundaries of, of manufacturing. If we, if we deal with sort of the scale of ambition of, of the, the program uh, and, and recognizing it's a, a very early stages, so you see in a program which you know could be in the range of. 400 to 600 prime systems uh, and then you know if you think sort of the, the through life opportunity uh, of supporting those um, you know you, you're going to measure this in the you know 50 to 75 billion mark over that uh, 60 70 years uh, I know it sounds a lot but if you, if you sort of take your view in terms of escalation different things it'll be in that sort of characteristic if you then start to decompose out of that, we draw the boundaries on on manufacturing. If people are doing uh, providing solutions for software coding, is that manufacturing? I don't know. If, if people are providing uh, systems and solutions for making raw material, powders, castings, forgings, or, or is it or, you know making robots, making the uh, complex infrastructure that's needed uh, to be able to deliver these solutions? Uh, so it's where do you draw the boundary of manufacturing? Um, you know there will be without a doubt. You know, significant uh, expenditure. And I think if you look back at what we've seen uh, spent on other large defence programmes, whether that be uh, Eurofighter Typhoon or whether that be the F-35, you know that you know history is a good predictor of the future in terms of how much of that sticks in the UK, how many jobs are generated. You know that sort of ratio. You know uh, broadly of sort of uh, eight stroke ten to one uh, from what you see within the prime contractors. As it extends down through that supply chain, so you're going to start to see, you know, tens of thousands of people for very long periods of time across that UK economy, uh, directly and indirectly benefit from from this scale of ambition. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we've had in says, are we at risk of building engineering products out of too many customizable parts? We make the new technologies less maintainable. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, so in terms of the requirement set uh, that we get uh, from our customer, uh, then uh, they describe them as the illities uh, and, and the challenge of lead systems integrators such as BA Systems or, or any of our contemporaries is how do we balance off that trade space between those illities? So, survivability, producibility, supportability. Uh, you know, extendability, um, um, serviceability, and, and and we we constantly hunt uh, around to balance those, those attributes away. If you think about the uh, overall system, uh, and then the level of qualification that takes place to certify it, uh, and we use the terminology "release to service," that creates almost like a gold seal standard. Okay. So your level of change from there on in, unless you want to rerun all of the qualification certification uh, of these complex systems, it's very extensive. Um, and and, and uh, more importantly, it's very expensive. So, so when you move away from that, you can substitute technologies, or this is what history has taught us, you can substitute technologies as long as you can demonstrate equivalence. Uh, clearly you can uh, look for upgrades opportunities in the in the uh, weapon system the, the aircraft uh, and then uh, introduce new technologies through life what what i think we're advocating uh, in this approach is that uh, within that requirement set within that design set there will be certain things which you will have more latitude to customize rather than 
customising the whole thing. And what I'm not advocating for those of you of a certain genre that this is, you know, the equivalent of Thunderbirds 2. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think what will happen is, um, and, and again, you know, who knows because because of, of where we are in the program, it's, you know, it's once in a lifetime this sort of phase of, of a contract. Um, you know, we are working in that trade space to understand how much of this is frozen and fixed, how much is dealt with through those other uh, parts of the solution, whether it be, you know, the one that's attritable, because you do lots of customization on that, uh, because, you know, we're closing the title, it doesn't come back, uh, versus how much is actually in the loyal wingman, where, um, you know, if you think about sort of our, our ethi ethical standards uh, and, and, uh, and trading, that, you know, our, our ability not to put a person at risk in a high conflict situation, you know, something we would, we would prosecute in, in that um, dull, dirty, dangerous aspect, um, you know, your, your unmanned their system space. Uh, and in that, you could see high levels of customization, probably not in the main the main platform, as we would know, the aircraft that you, that you put a person in. So I think, it'll, I think it's horses for courses in and around that. Yeah, I think particularly, I know obviously there's been a lot of um, uh, uh, publicity, and again, it was in your presentation about the use of additive. Um, and I guess, well, that's got, whilst they're customizable, it also means that they can be manufactured again and again to that exact same specification. Yes, I mean, the, 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 beauty, of, the beauty of additive, of course, yeah, the, the additive you're up, it, it is the ultimate ability to optimize, you know, that, that, that generative shape, you know, allows us, us as an industry, uh, you know, at you know, at large, and forget that sort of within the aerospace defence sector, it allows us to capitalise on on your imagination now. So you are you are uh, limited only by what you can model, and, and you know the the tool sets that are offered now from the uh, you know the, the digital suppliers uh, really doesn't inhibit that at all. Um, you know, you're just building in a keg. What it, what it does mean is, as you learn more through life then you do have the ability to enhance and substitute. As you get real-time feedback, your ability to make a new one, a replacement article is great. But it also means that you're not carrying the same stop levels, you're not carrying the same weight uh, that historically you've got with, with traditional manufacturing process. And I think where we're gonna go with this is that for what I would describe as frontline operations, um, where you know the, the end user, the warfighter, are taking these assets uh, and deploying them all around the world, the level of uh, logistics and stores that they would take with them will change. This whole digital thread and the ability to have almost mobile manufacturing technologies will create a space that says you almost take your factory with you for a number of the attributes. Uh, and I envisage that we'll have some of these processes that uh, you're either making a direct replacement, you know, uh, aircraft is sat out in, you know, uh, one of our uh, friendly country air bases. Uh, in Cyprus, uh, something breaks. We summon a design down from the mothership in the UK. It's all through a secure network, uh, and a new part is grown and made in 24 hours. You know, in, in some container that's supporting that aircraft uh, and, and fitted within 48 hours. That, that's you know, that's not fanciful. Um, or you have the ability to reverse engineer from something that's broke. Uh, and you make, um, you know, uh, what I would describe as a get me home, you know, back to the good old days of, of you know, your fan belt snaps and you look for an alternate, uh, you know, on, on real cars, not, not, not today's generation, but you have, you have something that, that's an improvisation, but it's good enough to be certified to get you back. And when you start looking at those technologies and those approaches, the sector agnostic, you know, whether we're talking about an air system or a land vehicle or, a, a, you know, a maritime solution, you imagine the workshops that sit on the new uh, two carriers that the, the UK uh, Navy has. You know, they're extensive. Can you imagine now equipping them with this sort of capability of thinking and allowing them to be able to be self-sufficient, you know, when they're out on, uh, you know, on, on the North Atlantic Patrol or around the Pacific and just no way of getting near a logistics depot. Uh, and I think that's a great space for us to play into as the engineering and manufacturing sector. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I, I, I appreciate I'm rattling through these. I'm, I'm going to do another two questions because I know we're um, getting towards the end of our time. 
Uh, the next one that came in said there's an identifiable root cause to the UK, uh, sorry, is there an identifiable root cause to the UK's productivity gap versus rest of the world? Can technology address it or do you think it's cultural? Oh, wow. We could get Jürgen on because this, he and I could talk about this for the rest of the day. Uh, I think it's all of the above. Um, I, I think I think we shouldn't try to attribute blame to anybody. That's the first, the first thing that, that we shouldn't do. But, but I do think uh, it presents itself in uh, a number of uh, facets. I think lack of ambition is one. Uh, uh, so lack of ambition in terms of the level of commitment of uh, all people at all levels in all organisations to uh, invest either in people uh, or in infrastructure or machinery. Uh, it, it then uh, links into um, the brand and promotion uh, and culture of uh, the perceptions of uh, engineering and manufacturing uh, being uh, dirty, uh, Arkwright's mill type approach. So we, we've kind of lost the war on publicity uh, and trying to project that a good number of people on this call, indeed ourselves, you know, we are high tech industries. We are some of the safest in the world. The environments we offer, uh, you know, some of the best. And indeed, when you take a, a sense of the COVID challenges, um, you know, a good number of enterprises who are dialed in today will be the companies which are open uh, and providing key support uh, and services despite everything else that, that runs around us. You know, so, so we've lost that bit. Um, we, we went through a period whereby uh, offshoring uh, became the vogue uh, and we've seen the challenges and consequences uh, of that against a pandemic and it really polarises, I think, people's thinking now in terms of how well do you understand the supply chain, the effectiveness of it. Um, I, I think we uh, we started to encourage people uh, in university and academia that, that maybe uh, there were other professions which were more noble and of higher esteem uh, than working in engineering and manufacturing uh, is perceived in the UK. Uh, and, you know, I think that's morally wrong when you look at some of the great engineers and manufacturers and, you know, just people on the court today, I can't see you all, you know, in terms of what you do, uh, either in terms of providing opportunities and, and wealth or in terms of the intellectual capacity uh, or the professionalism and brand that you bring forward uh, and the employment that you offer uh, and then the impact you make in your uh, in your local areas um, and, and contributions through through that CSR agenda. And I just think it, it keeps coming in layers. And I think it's not one single thing. And, you know, Jürgen will, will say, you know, we've underinvested in, in the digital infrastructure, in, in automation, robotics, disruptive technology, a reluctance to, to, uh, to uh, respond to change. You know, we've been happy with our lot. It's working, so why change? I'm okay, Jack, sort of thing. And I think when you start adding up all of those things as very small um, incremental issues, then suddenly you, you end up with this uh, quite a chasm of our perceived productivity uh, versus that of some of our contemporaries around the world. I'm absolutely convinced that the intellectual capacity of, of people within the UK is on a par, if not better, than a lot of nations we see. Yeah, we know that our uh, supply chain infrastructure and capability you know, is, is a lot better than uh, emerging nations and those who aspire to uh, be preeminent in the engineering and manufacturing arena. So there's something else going on. Uh, and I think it's up to all of us to start to address that and make those in incremental improvements. And one final question with Ted come through says, as a UK supplier, how do we get involved with the Tempest program? Okay, that's a great one. So, so, uh, you know, we, we are keen uh, to uh, to understand the capabilities out there. You know, we are working uh, closely with, with uh, uh, trade associations such as the MTA, you know, valuable links there. Uh, we're working with academia, we're working through Chambers of Commerce. Um, you know, if, if that's not landing uh, and connecting, you know, through the Aerospace Alliance, through the AGP, uh, through Defence Solutions Centre, uh, the, the DGP, then, then by all means, uh, via uh, uh, James, uh, you can have me email, you can drop me, drop me a line, uh, I'll respond back to you personally, or I'll, I'll put you in contact uh, with with one of our team uh, that uh, understands the specialism and, of, of service and capability that you've got.
great stuff. Thank you so much. Um, there's quite a few other questions I've had come through. Um, I've taken note of some of them. For those people that are asking about um, if it's possible to visit facilities when it's reopened um, or whether or not they can get in touch, um, can I suggest that you email events at mta.org.uk? Uh, um, and then I will forward that on um, if that's all right with you, Dave. And I'll send those. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, to yeah, that's fantastic. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much um, to uh, Dave for joining us today. Really appreciate your time um, and all that you've covered this morning. It's been really well received and through the questions that are still coming through, um, I can see there's been a lot of engagement with that. Um, just reminder to everyone to join us for more. In half an hour's time, we've got Rhys Herbert, who is the Senior Economist at Lloyds Bank, talking about the economic update. Um, and this afternoon, we've got Jürgen Meyer talking about Made Smarter. Um, there's also lots more coming up over the next couple of days if you want to take a look at the Mac website. Similarly, I'd also encourage you all to check out the A to Z there so you can have a look at exhibitors um, who will be at the show and you can obviously make contact and start talking to them before that. Just a quick plea that as soon as this session ends, there will be a feedback form pop up. If you could just take two minutes to fill that in, it does help us for the next couple of sessions, um, as well as planning content for the physical event next April. So finally, once again, thank you very much to David Holmes and hope to see you all in the next session. Many thanks.